Room is ready. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to the meeting of the Planning Commission meeting, Wednesday, January 25th, this evening. Um, before we get started tonight, this is still a hybrid meeting, so I'm going to ask Becky Pepper um, to read through um, the rules for the hybrid meeting. Thank you very much, Chair. Good evening, everyone. My name is Becky Pepper, Planning Manager. Joining me here in the City Commission room is Jeff Crick, Planning and Development Services Director, and Ellie Mullins, who will be helping to facilitate the Zoom video portion of the meeting. And we will work along the chair to facilitate the meeting proceedings. This meeting is being recorded and broadcast on the city's YouTube channel and cable channel 25. Please remember to mute yourself during the meeting when you're not speaking. The chat function for this public meeting is disabled. All chats will go directly to the Zoom facilitator. Unless you're participating during the meeting, please turn your video off. This allows the active meeting participants to be seen on screen. You'll still be able to hear the meeting, and when you are participating, please turn your video on. If you have any trouble, you can send a chat to the Zoom facilitator. The city reserves the right to mute people and turn uh, individual videos off to minimize distraction during the meeting. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Becky. I am hearing an echo. <laughs> yes. Maybe the lobby audio. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We okay to go? Okay. Uh, all right. Um, first up, communications. Uh, do we have any written communications to receive from the public? All communications were included as part of your packet. Uh, ri any written communications from staff, planning commissioners, or, or other commissioners? None this evening. Any written action of any waiver request determinations made by the city engineer? Also none this evening. Any disclosure of ex parte communications? All right. Uh, declaration of abstentions from specific agenda items by commissioners. All right. Uh, the next portion of the meeting is general public comment. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on things that are not on the agenda this evening. Does anybody have a general public comment that does not involve an agenda item for this evening? Seeing none, we'll move. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I was looking down. Could you please? Oh, the mic again. Is it still echoing out there? Yes. I think Denny's working on it. Okay. We, will, we are working on it, and I will t speak closer to the microphone. Is that better? Good? Okay. So we'll move on to the regular agenda. Um, we have item number one is to receive an update on the code assessment for land development. Um, Becky Pepper is the staff presenting that. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'll keep this uh, short because I, I don't want to steal from their time or from their presentation. Um, we are very fortunate to have Clarion Associates um, helping us with the update to our land development code, um, which is the document that uh, pertains to our zoning and land use regulations. And um, we have, uh, at the beginning part of, of this process, um, we have completed a, an assessment of our existing land development code. And we have Elizabeth Garvin and uh, Gabby Hart here with us tonight from Clarion Associates who are going to be providing an overview of that code assessment um, and then there'll be uh, an opportunity to provide your feedback. I also do want to note that they'll be uh, joining us for our mid-month meeting on February 8th um, to give you some more time to um, go through that code assessment document and um, gather more input for them. So with that, I will turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Becky. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, good evening, Planning Commission members, the staff members, and the public. I'm Elizabeth Garvin. I'm a director with Clarion Associates in Denver. I'm here with my colleague, Gabby Hart, who's a senior associate with our firm. We um, and some of our other staff members have been working on the land development code update, and we've reached the kind of first deliverable part. So this is a report on what we see um, in the current regulations, um, where the city could go forward and make changes to help implement the various planning efforts that you've undertaken, and where we're going to dive in when we start our drafting process uh, Friday morning. So we are going to share with you an overview. The goal of this part of the process is to gather information. And so it is um, more of a roadmap or a scouting report. We know we're going to dig deeper as we go forward. We're looking for input and comments as we go, and we'll reflect those on the project website. So I'm going to see if I can bring this up. <laughs> Thank you. 
you have to share your screen like you're in a Zoom meeting. <coughs> Okay. Whoops, wrong share. Okay, waiting for the whole thing to come up. Thank you. Um, I want to let um, everyone know that I have some hearing loss, and this setting is really challenging. So um, periodically, I might ask you to repeat a question. And I apologize for that, but just let you know I'm in advance. I've cranked up my hearing aids as high as they go. So if you hear feedback, it's like probably me over here. OK, so let's get going. <coughs> so tonight's meeting. We'll do about the project, um, we'll do the code assessment overview, identify some of the key topics that we've been discussing with the project steering committee and the public, and talk about the next steps in the process. This is the project timeline. So um, we are doing this in four steps, and I'm sorry the fourth step is um, covered by the um, camera shot over there, but we did project orientation from June through August, um, code assessment September through December of last year. We are moving into the drafting phases right now, so we're finishing up the assessment and starting off the drafting, and we anticipate moving into a full draft later this year, going into early next year. We'll talk about what goes into these um, third and fourth phases a little bit going forward. So we have a steering committee um, for the land development code update. I um, just shared everybody's names here. They're on the website. And we have met with the steering committee twice. We'll meet with them again tomorrow evening, uh, followed by an open meeting with the public to talk about whatever is on people's minds um, related to the code assessment. We will also follow up this set of meetings with some more um, public outreach on the website. And depending on the feedback we get, um, some additional um, work in the community. One of the things that we try to do um, on a code project, though, is get the code assessment in place and start drafting, because the drafting builds on the assessment, so we don't spend a lot of time perfecting the assessment. We spend a lot more time drafting. So we're going to take comments, but we'll roll those into the drafting process. So there's public outreach for each phase of drafting, um, and that was related to the um, four phases of the project, and then within some there are additional phases. Um, we post the draft documents um, and the public documents on the website. In Lawrence, we're working with um, a website that's set up in a format to allow people to comment on the drafts. So the drafts are PDFs, but it's within um, a setting that you can pop a comment in and everybody else can read the comments. So that's on the website now. We've had people comment. If you want to go take a look or comment, please feel free. Um, that's one of the ways that we encourage the community to interact with each other. Sometimes Sometimes people love what we're going to propose to do about affordable housing or people hate what we're proposing to do and we have that conversation going on in the document itself where they can see either in this case what we propose to do or later what the language looks like. We're also doing with each phase um, in person and virtual reading um, meetings. We are working with um, the equity and inclusion and the communications and creative resources departments um, to provide guidance for continuous improvement to our process. So each time we do outreach, we circle back, we spend a minute talking about was it effective, was it not effective, what else can we do next time, um, and then we update going forward. So across this year, um, we'll be including more hands-on opportunities. So far, we've just been talking to people. Right now, we're starting to put together um, kind of a meeting in a box project, which will allow um, community groups to take and do meetings about. We want to learn a little bit more about neighborhood character and how we can regulate with and around that. Um, and we anticipate a few more of those opportunities going forward. Um, at all times, the website is open for comment and staff is taking um, comment and we share that information with each other. We're about to go live with a new section on the website called What We're Hearing in the Community. So as we receive comments, because sometimes people submit comments to staff or us instead of steering committee or you, we're going to make sure that all gets posted and gets circulated. We want everyone to be able to see what the comments are. It's a community discussion. Oops. 
Okay, so our project goals. We have uh, four basic goals to get started. Update the land development code to support and implement Plan 2040 and the Lawrence Strategic Plan, also the downtown plan. Um, but we'll get to a slide in a minute where we talk about all the plans that are out there and how we bring them into the process. We want to identify opportunities to achieve city goals um, related to high-level topics like climate change, sustainability, housing, economic development, and other priorities. And those are starting to um, become more clear as we go through the process. We'll talk about some of the special topics that we think will weave their way through the entire project. Um, those are outlined in the code assessment and we'll spend some time on those in a little bit. We're looking to establish a um, simpler and more consistent set of development procedures. Um, that in itself is a project. It's going to be super fun and we're going to have a good time doing that. Um, and we're looking to make the land development code more user-friendly, searchable, and easy to understand. Um, moving forward, the city will be codifying the land development code. That will make it more searchable um, than it is right now. But there are also things that we can do with graphics and layout um, to make the code um, simpler and easier to navigate. We know a land development code has a few different audiences. Some just use it once or twice, some use it all the time, and we need to speak to all those people. So what's in the code assessment? Um, we have five functional parts, particularly for planning commission. Um, we start with the guiding plans and policies. We talk about the current land development code analysis, some foundational changes that we need to make in the code, a brief annotated outline of what the um, new code format's gonna look like and some conclusions and next steps. There is a summary of an initial survey that we did in there and notes from the steering committee meeting in December at the end of the document in case anybody wants to look at those. And again, that's all on the website. <coughs> So when we met with the steering committee initially to talk about this, and these notes are the ones attached at the end of the document, we started with some high level questions and I'm sharing these with you just to let you know kind of where the conversation is as we start moving into the project. So at a really high level we asked, what does neighborhood character mean in Lawrence? That was a great discussion. Um, we talked about the future of commercial and industrial business parks. This is a change that's really interesting across the community. We asked how to think about um, coordination between historic preservation and infill development or redevelopment. Um, and that is turning um, particularly going forward around adaptive reuse and housing. So we'll see how we bring all those pieces together in the discussion. We asked if it would be helpful to think about adding neighborhood meetings prior um, to some planning commission reviews of some applications and what would happen if we asked um, to formalize a neighborhood meeting process. And then we backed out and asked how the community thinks about water use, um, which is a big topic in Plan 2040. So if you want to see the responses to that, those are in the notes. But just to let you know, we start out at a pretty high level and we ask general questions um, like this because we anticipate that there are maybe you know 15 people in Lawrence that think about zoning in terms of zoning or subdivision in terms of subdivision. I'm looking at half of them and then the rest of them are probably floating around. But when we talk to people about explain to us neighborhood character or explain to us infill development, we start getting the information that we want to see for where the code should be going. So it, it doesn't seem like it's really code focused but most people just don't want to think that that way. Okay, so guiding plans and policies is part one of the code assessment. Looking at plan 2040, I think you guys are probably pretty familiar with it, so um, our key chapters, environment and natural resources, growth and development, Lawrence neighborhoods and housing, and specific land use and reference plans. Along those lines, Plan 2040 works with a number of specific land use plans and reference plans. So part of our work is looking through these and trying to figure out how they come back together into the overall regulatory structure. Some of these are older and will be updated as part of the city's work plan going forward. Some of these are very current and there are some ongoing plans right now and we've been talking to people involved in those processes trying to figure out how we link uh, the code update to the climate action plan or um, to some of the other um, affordable housing plans, some of the other things that are going on right now. So we're trying to stay in touch with what's going on and we're trying to capture what's happened recently. Um, Downtown Lawrence plan, we'll be working with this plan also. Um, it has detail within the plan that can be reflected through zoning and subdivision, through development standards. And so we'll work through the guiding principles in the downtown plan to think about what we're doing within the code that can better meet um, these goals and can 
take some of the functional sub areas and reflect them in the regulatory process. Okay. The middle part of the code assessment is an analysis of the current land development code. So this is where we're looking at what's in there um, to think about how it can be improved moving forward. So some of our big topics um, that we're gonna dive into as we start the drafting process are to first fine tune the zoning districts. We think there can be changes made um, within the current zoning districts, some consolidations, um, some conversion to mixed use um, that can help better align those districts with uh, Plan 20. 40, the downtown plan, um, and some of the other plans. Some of you, I'm sure, have already jumped to what do we do if you start changing up the zone districts? How do we manage that going forward? And we'll have that conversation as we go through this process. So um, we we joke that our job is always to fix the engine while the car is running, and um, that's what we'll do here with you. So we'll, we'll bring forward proposed changes, and then we'll talk about how you can roll out those proposed changes. Second big theme for us is organizing and updating the land use, um, the use regulations, so the use tables consolidating um, the residential and non-residential use tables. One of the things that we want to say now and we want to keep saying as we go forward is we can start thinking about this as more of an electronic document than a paper document. And we are going to be thinking about ways that we navigate it online. You may well be like me and you like your 400 page code because it's like a teddy bear and you can carry it around everywhere. We won't take that away from you. But we do want to start thinking about places where we can consolidate something that may have seemed big in a paper code code is more easily navigable in an electronic document. So those are conversations we'll be having about how we navigate. So we're going to update and relocate some of the use category descriptions. Um, we, we tend to work within districts and uses first because that's kind of the DNA of the zoning. Um, in Lawrence's case, you have both the traditional, the more Euclidean districts, or they're not, they're not Euclidean anymore because they're Eu Euclidean plus, but you also have smart code. Um, and there are some concepts in the smart code that we are going to look to bring in to the regular code instead of having them as separate documents. They can work together. And so that's that's part of what we're going to be doing in the districts and uses. Um, ultimately, we want to clean up and systematically organize the use standards as we move this forward. So development standards, when, when we say development standards, we're talking about things that are generally applicable across the communities. So that could be parking, could be lighting, could be landscaping, um, those things where you go to a whole section instead of to a zone district. And what we think in Lawrence might be helpful is thinking about character-based development standards. Um, so there might be different downtown standards for parking than there are more suburban standards for parking than there are more <coughs> rural or ag standards for parking. And, um, Parking may not be the best example of that. There could be other places where we're thinking about building design or we're thinking about site layout um, that we tailor those standards. What we want to do is move away from one size fits all standards. The community has different parts to it, different characters to it. Um, and we want to make sure that you can um, tailor and pull together the right standards for the right location. That's particularly important where you think you're going to see infill and redevelopment. Um, infill and redevelopment can be more challenging than sort of greenfield development, and we want to make sure the code um, gives you that flexibility and clarity to get the development in without um, looking to do variances or waivers or change the regulations altogether or do planned development. We're going to look at development type transitions, um, something that we know we see in communities where you are increasing development through redevelopment or um, changing you know, housing types, including more mix, missing middle housing going forward with that, is people worry about, am I going to have a 14-story building next to my one-story house? Um, and so what we do is we bring in transitional standards that talk about how buildings come together, how they come together and how they feel from a human perspective, um, because that's how we live our lives. How do we feel what's going on in this space? Um, so we'll have some of that in there. We think we can sort of raise the bar on site and structure standards. We also think we can consolidate um, some of the things that are outside of the code in the development standards back into the code. Um, so we'll bring all this together. Finally, on this slide, we're going to look to support the multimodal transportation system with some mobility and connectivity standards. That's very jargony. We're going to look at how people move around the community, and we're going to see that the land use patterns reflect and support that. So 
Another key topic, protect environmentally sensitive areas and incorporate sustainability. Not the same thing, um, different things, but we have grouped them together for the moment because we, while we know um, pretty much what Lawrence sees as environmentally sensitive areas, we are want to sort of probe deeper into what Lawrence sees as sustainability and ultimately resilience. And so those are the conversations we'll start having before we start drafting. We get to some of these things later in the drafting so that allows us to have some early conversations about, hey, are we looking for infrastructure resilience? Are we looking for sustainability through compact development or water use or both? Um, so we want to drill down a little bit and make sure that we're capturing the right ideas and then propose um, standards for that. One of the other things in that area that we're seeing um, as we work in other communities is trying to understand what we want to make um, obligatory and what we want to make optional. Um, we're finding, Gabby and I are working in a couple communities where we've added solar standards to the regulations and people have been really upset with us and we were like, why are you upset about solar standards? And because they think we're forcing them um, to add solar to their property. And so we're trying to have that conversation earlier. What are we getting ready for? Not that we're asking you to do, but what do we see coming down the road? Another place where we see this conversation taking really interesting turns is with um, electrical, electric vehicle parking. Um, so we'll have some of those conversations as we go forward, and they'll be fun. OK, so th those were our big topics. And as you all know, they, they incorporate a lot of smaller ideas. Some of our code foundation priorities, we want to reorient the code to draft for predictability. Um, so what we see when we look at the current land development code, some unnecessarily complicated and legalistic language. Um, I, I'm an attorney, and I am sure that I'm responsible for that in somebody else's code, but not yours going forward. Um, so. What we want to make sure is that we write in plain English, and more so that we write in ways that are understandable um, for people who don't speak code, right? So we, we want to get there with everybody. We see that there are um, subjective standards in the code. You cannot make a land development code entirely objective and measurable, but there are ways that we can get into some of the current subjective standards and make them more predictable and make them more objective than they are right now. And so one of our goals is to be um, doing that. When we get to more objective standards, we make the entire process more predictable for the applicant and the city. So that is one of our big goals. We want to provide greater clarity. Um, we want to make sure that people can understand the complex parts of the code. Um, we can write a code in plain language, but that doesn't mean it's really clear because some things get complex. And so um, we look to add graphics or tables, illustrations, photographs, um, or just break up the language until we've gotten into such small sentences that you can work your way through it. So that's where we want to go. There's some duplicated information in the current code. We want to take that out. And we want to reconcile internal inconsistencies. Um, we want to make sure that as you go into the code, you can figure out as a user what you're supposed to do, and as a code applier what you're supposed to apply. Um, so still thinking about users, um, when we, when we want to do a user-friendly code, we have a few things that we do pretty consistently. So we can see on the left side, the image on the left side here is the current set of regulations, and the image on the right side um, is, is likely where we'll go in our first round um, with some of the zone districts. So we change up the layout, we prioritize the information that's important, we take sentences out and move them to tables so you can just find um, numbers or standards more quickly and then we add graphics that are linked back to those tables. So we want a clear and repeatable organization so you learn what to expect from the chapters and we want to improve the document and the page layout um, so it's less dense so it's easier to navigate. We want to add illustrations and graphics. We have um, places where we know we want to add illustrations and graphics, part of our conversation with the community is what would help you? Where can we add an image that would help explain a concept? Not only does an image help explain a concept, it helps set shared expectations. We are both now looking at the same lot. Um, you might design the house differently, but what the code is saying, it needs to be set in this place on the lot. And what the picture in my mind is the same as the picture in your mind, because we're looking at this picture here. Or we can have a lovely, robust conversation about why this picture should be completely different, which is a conversation that we anticipate, but the picture gets us to a starting point for it. 
Um, we want to relocate some supporting information outside of the code. The code doesn't need to include all of the administrative information that it currently does. Um, normally, we recommend some of that be moved out to applications, be moved out to a user's guide. Um, so we'll talk about what we can do with some of that. And then we want to group and update all the definitions and measurements. The current code has definitions kind of slotted in throughout. And um, we like to do that old school definitions, organized alphabetically thing um, with some exceptions of course because we'll say well we can put the you know sign definitions all together or something like that but we'll talk about that in that section we also want to make sure that we get in and clarify or define all the different ways we measure things within a code we measure height we measure distances um, that's another place where we can have a shared expectation that's set up by the code so we'll go in and start doing that so as we start restructuring and streamlining the development procedures, um, we try to orient the code users with initial tables and graphics. So this first table on the upper right, little hard to read, I'm sorry, it's small. But this is intended to be, OK, I'm rezoning my property. What are my five big steps? Right. So you can go in and see that. Um, every place where we can say, you need to know that this is where you're moving forward, we'll put a table in. Um, we will draft the procedures consistently and repetitively. Um, so people who use the code all the time can say, well, I know there should be an applicability section. I know there should be some review criteria. I know that there should be, well, what happens if you want to change after your approval is granted? So we want to clarify that we provide all that information for all the applications. We're um, thinking that we're going to start in with a process to allow um, some minor modifications or administrative adjustments, kind of moving away from organization into what do we think we need to do to get a little more flexibility in the code. We think about flexibility in the procedural um, realm as there are minor things um, that happen just because when someone gets out on a site, they have missed something or they find something they didn't see at first. That shouldn't be a place to blow up an entire approval. That should be a place to do a minor adjustment. And so we want to make sure that we capture real life and put it in the regulations. Um, and then we are more specific about, you know, well, what's major? You know, if you, you know, designed your entire project without ever looking at your site and you now have 17 minor modifications, that's a different conversation. So we'll work in there. Um, we, we realize that um, development is, you know, done first on paper and then on property and that things change. So we want to get in there and allow some of that, but we don't want to um, sort of water down the regulations. Okay, moving forward just a little bit. These are our special topics. I um, touched on this a few minutes ago. We think we're gonna have three topics that really inform in entire pieces of the code and they work together with each other. So we think zoning for affordable housing and will be a topic that we discuss through the zoning, through the uses, through the development standards, and through the processes. It takes um, concerted effort to get affordable housing going. and. Let's back up a second. We will define affordable in two ways. We will define affordable as capital A affordable, so that is technically affordable to people that meet the um, area or adjusted median income of Lawrence. That is set as your affordable housing um, cap or goal. But we're also talking about putting more housing, small a, affordable, more housing in the community at a lower price point. So it still may be more expensive than capital A affordable housing, but one of the ways that we get more housing that's affordable is to get to more housing. So we'll be talking about that across the process. And we'll be talking about drafting the land development code for equity. And that comes through in multiple different places in the code. It's how do we think about neighborhoods and community? How do we design um, for the different people that will um, live in different areas? How are we thinking about all of our residents within the code? And then equity also comes through in the procedures. How do we make it easy for people to get in? How do we make the code understandable and accessible? And finally, equity has a third piece in our project. How do we make sure, as your consultants working with our staff team that we're working with, that we're getting out into the community and we're talking to all the voices we usually hear and then new voices. So we want to make sure that we're doing that, that we're getting people involved in the project and we're making the project open and inviting to everyone. 
And then finally, we come back to ensuring environmental sustainability. Um, this theme is in the city's strategic plan. It's in plan 2040. It um, rolls through some of the other plans. Um, so we'll be picking up sustainability um, and deciding where and how we want to bring it into this process. Coming up closer to the end here, so the proposed organization going forward, there's a much longer version of this table in the draft. And so this table shows how we think the code will be reorganized. So down the left side is um, where the individual sections will go. Down the right side are some comments, um, mostly technical comments, about bringing the information together. So this table um, at the back end of the code assessment shows what the um, new LDC organization looks like. It identifies some new content. Um, so you'll see like on under Article 10, and this is really small. I'm sorry, next time I'm going to use bigger images. Um, it says new site layout and requirement um, improvement standards. So uh, you can read through and see where we've moved stuff over, where we've added new stuff. Know that simply because we pulled a title in and said it's going to go here doesn't mean it's not going to get edited. But this is just where it's going to go. So for organizational purposes, we want to make sure that we've accounted for all of the current information and started identifying the new information. And this helps us find gaps. Um, because we have you know, codes that we've done before, model codes that we've worked with, peer communities that we're working with, and we'll say, you know, well, we see that you know, Lawrence completely doesn't have XYZ thing. So this would be something we want to put in the new code. I don't know what XYZ thing is, so don't worry that I'm keeping something from you. I'll tell you when we find something you don't have. So conclusions and next steps. The, the code assessment phase is complete. The comments are not complete. So I, I want to be super clear for you guys, but for anyone that's listening or um, watches this later, we are not going to rewrite the code assessment, but we really welcome comments on it. Those will get rolled forward into the drafting process. And we will be really transparent with how we pick up the comments and move them forward. We start after um, our steering committee meeting tomorrow and our public outreach, um, moving into the drafting phases. And so on this schedule, from February through April, um, we do what we're calling module one. That'll be zone districts and uses. Um, so late March, early April, we'll be back in front of you with a draft of that to talk about. Here's where we think we can go with the zone districts and the uses. Same process, um, May through July, we do the development standards. So we revise the development development standards, come back to the community, post the draft, talk about it. And then finally, last step, we do administration and procedures. And so again, draft it, bring it, share it, and talk about it. Um, all of the drafts get posted to the website. They get distributed to anyone that might ask for a copy of it, anyone that wants to see it. Um, we're happy to take comments. For all of these drafts, we'll do the same thing on the website, where we post it and let um, people who want to on the website Send, uh, share their comments on there. So um, those are all available to the public to look at. We will um, work to figure out what we think the outreach needs to be um, in all three of these segments. And, um, and then at the end, so moving into next year, we start revising and we pull it all together. And then we have a full draft. Um, the reason we do the modules like this is um, just to kind of, you know, turn the code into more bite-sized pieces. Each one of these will run probably over 100 pages. And um, we've learned that there's kind of a max limit to how much anyone wants to sit and read draft zoning code. Um, so we try to break these down that way and organize them by topic so people can get into it. So we, we will do our best to make the zoning um, and subdivision and the other parts of the code tempting um, and interesting. And when that fails, we'll just have fun meetings and talk about whatever. Um, so what have we got coming up here? Um, part six and seven, I don't think I summarized these for this evening. That summary of the initial community outreach was pretty high level outreach. We wanted to let people know the process was going to start. We do anticipating doing more detailed surveying going forward um, and the steering committee notes. So what's coming up next? Um, so we have a steering committee meeting tomorrow and a community outreach meeting right after that. We are working on um, putting up FAQs and fact sheets on the website, and we anticipate having hard copies of those tomorrow to hand out and share. So um, we know that people kind of need uh, what's zoning or what's a land development code 101, what are zone districts. So we try to translate some of this into where they are and what they want to know. We also know that when we start a project like this, we get a lot of um, good questions about what's my zoning and can I do this on my property. So we try to um, send people off to the right 
um, person or the right page on the website to find the information they're looking for. Um, sometimes those questions lead us to much deeper discussions. So, you know, we're always happy to have a community member come to us with an issue because sometimes there's really something else hiding underneath that. We're getting the what are we hearing part of the website up. We have had some comments submitted to us, um, some higher level comments, and um, incorporated some of that into this process. We're working on drafting module one. Um, we think that'll be January through April, although um, Gabby and I decided that we might be um, inspired to do it faster because the NCAA regional playoffs are in Kansas City in March, but we'll see how that goes. You can't make zoning go any faster than it'll go. So, um, so keep an eye on the project website. And that's it. So, and um, as Becky mentioned earlier, we do have a follow-up conversation um, with you um, bright and early on February 8th. So I will be up making coffee before we all sit down for that. So we're, we're here for questions, and we're here to you know kind of answer questions that you might have about where we're going forward, um, and you know at your pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. This is a huge mm -hmm. undertaking. So um, we do have scheduled, um, before we um, bring it back up here, uh, an opportunity for public comment mm -hmm. um, on this. Um, it's I mean, There's a lot here, so I'm, I'm not expecting, expect, expecting a lot of detailed um, comment, but I do want to open it up to anybody from the public who would like to make some comments on what you've seen so far. Uh, and then we'll discuss this a little bit more about the timeline and public input, I'm sure. Uh, but at this time, I would open up for any three-minute comment on the Lawrence Development Code. Seeing nobody in the room, anybody online wish to comment? Okay, there's going to be plenty of opportunity, as we just learned, for public comment. So I do hope people take advantage of that, um, rather than, at least ahead of time, be a part of the process, rather than waiting till the end and then reacting. It's always helpful to get it up front. So um, that's, a, that's a good thing to keep an eye out on. So I'll bring it back to the commission for any questions uh, for staff or, uh, or uh, Ms. Garvin. I have a question. Yes. Hi, thanks for being here. <clears throat> um, I'm curious to learn how public comment gathering has gone, um, maybe relative to other projects you've done. Have you seen the right amount, not enough, too much? And is there anything we can do to um, uh, help get the word out that this is, their feedback is important? That's a, that's a great question, thank you. So we, we're off to, an average start, I would say. Um, I think that um, code projects in particular start kind of slow. People tend to watch from the edges at first and not really jump in. We find that it um, usually takes that first draft of code update to get people involved. We are seeing comments on the draft code assessment on the website, um, and we are starting to receive some comments by email. Um, we have more attendance. We had more attendance at the second steering committee meeting than we did at the first. So in terms of what do we typically see, this is building and that's lovely. This is our first big um, opportunity with the forum and so um, the invitation to speak to planning commission and share this information usually leads to more feedback. Additionally, we find that when we start putting more um, subject-based surveys on the website, that's when we um, capture kind of a different group of people that prefer um, working, you know, in an electronic fashion. So it's going fine and we anticipate that it will go up. If it does not go up, that's when we will start um, thinking about other ways um, to bring people into the process. But you know, so so far, I think that it is um, gathering speed and momentum, just about in the way that it would. So, um, is it a true statement to say that? Um uh, for anyone who's ever found themselves with a bit of code that they didn't like or didn't make sense, that it's far better to bring that topic now than to wait until after this process is done. Absolutely. We we are here to do code therapy. So if people want to come talk about problems they've had with the code, that's great. We awesome. can do that. And, thank you. And it's all helpful. So thank that's you for bringing that up. Thank you. I like that, code therapy. 
Any other comments? I, I just have one um, mm -hmm. general question in terms of how mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the module that's coming back yeah. to the Planning Commission. Is that how you foresee these individual modules coming back for discussion to the Planning Commission? Yes. Is it, okay. Yeah, so we, we, so the way we draft is um, we draft it, we share it with staff for our first round of cleanup, um, and then we will run it through the steering committee for additional input um, to make sure that we've captured everything we want to. We'll probably do a second round of edits in there. Um, then we'll share that version um, with steering committee again, but also with planning commission, and we'll ask it pretty much what your pleasure is for how to talk about it. We can um, do a couple meetings, walk you through it in one meeting, take comments and questions, and another meeting um, but you know it, it, it usually takes us about a module to sort of get a rhythm going with this so we we try you know just to be available in the ways that you think will be helpful um, to go through it however we can yeah thank you mm -hmm. um, I don't know is there any other yes I, I, I'm one of those you referred to as needing the teddy bear approach absolutely um, so I read all of this and um, to, to me, code is a complicated issue. I was going to say, I, I, maybe I only see the things that I look for in the code. I thought there was a lot of emphasis that I liked on looking at the character, mm -hmm. not just the objective things in it, but the character of areas, and I, I think that is extremely important to have that in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, had, I had marked some things where I had failed to adequately um, read, apparently, about the steering committee notes, and so some of the things I took exception to, and I thought, are you really writing this in the code? And one of them was a comment on page 54 that said, be wary of gathering too much public input. <laughs> we and wanted to make sure that we accurately reflected <laughs> the meeting. And, um, but and yeah. I thought, goodness, I hope that is not a part of, a part of this. Uh, but overall, I, th I thought it was very good. Um, not my first exposure to it, but I thought it is thoughtful in its approach. Um, I, I think code, I'm glad that these guys are, are here to walk us through and the ones that, that are behind the scenes to walk it through. But, but I applaud you for the approach that you have taken and how you have presented it. Um, so good job, stress character, um, and don't do the one that says don't listen to the pub, don't listen to the public. <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate the time you put into it and your thanks. That feels really good. Thank you. I, I, I do I'll bring us back to context on that. Um, you know it, sometimes an issue can just really get dragged out, right? And but that's okay. Um, our, our feeling is, you know, we're going to talk about it as long as we need to talk about it. We do have a time frame on this project, but one thing that we say um, to our partner communities is, we want you to end up with a living document, and we are going to do our very best as a community to get to that place of, of putting it in. But there will probably be a few things in there that you look at later that had you know, lots of conversation, and after you've had some time with it, usually we recommend six months to a year, you may want to open it up again and rethink some of it. Um, so we, we do try to bear in mind that you know, some things are really deeply felt in the community, and us saying this is the right answer is not necessarily going to be the end of the discussion. So we will make sure that we bring that information back, and, and we will have lots of meetings. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You've made mm -hmm. this into something that I think um, I'm really going to look forward to. Actually. Thank you. I'm going to remind you of that in May or June. Yes, that's right. <laughs> when we're here right. at midnight. Yes, again. Is there okay. anything else I can answer for you? I, I don't hear see any uh, hands raised for further comments. So thank you very much. Yeah, we appreciate everyone's time tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. I'd like to make one oh. comment. I'd just like to encourage everybody on the commission to <clears throat> read through 
plan 2040 mm -hmm. multiple times uh, before this comes back and visit our current development code, especially the use tables, and kind of think through things that you've seen since you've been on the commission that have been <laughs> problematic. So when we come back with this first version, we have some of the background and groundwork. We're already ready to engage in some discussion up here because ultimately the final uh, version of the new land development code is going to come before this body for another review and <clears throat> whatever recommendations we have before it's forwarded on to the city commission. So the more you can get involved with understanding what we have now, <laughs> the better the conversations will be and the less traumatic it's going to be <laughs> when that comes up. Um, speaking as one of the few remaining people up here that went through Plan 2040, start now. <laughs> so. Yes, I would um, echo that as the other person who went through Plan 2040. So. One of the other people. And David. And David, that's right. There's three of us. So, okay. Um, if we're all good with that. We're going to move on to item number two, please. Uh, Consider approving a preliminary development plan for 6th and Monterey, Monterey Way PCD, southeast corner of Monterey and 6th Street. The staff presenting this particular project is Mary Miller. Good evening, commissioners, and I will have a brief presentation with this. Um, this revised plan and development plan was before you in December, and uh, we went through the process and had the comments, and then you returned it to staff to allow us time to review a variance that was requested from Section 20-810E2 of the subdivision regulations. And um, so I'm going to basically talk about the variance, but I, I will be able to answer questions if you have any about the overall development. Uh, and this, just to refresh your memory, is what was being proposed with that development plan. Uh, this had formerly been apartments, and this revised plan is recommending single dwelling residences with two access points on Morgan Lane. And the uh, variance is being requested from section, as I said, 20-810-2. Uh, street connection shall provide access to adjoining lands existing and proposed streets. And this graphic shows the area. Um, the PDP for Monterey Way is basically this area. This is a subject property, and then it follows this line and goes up here. Some of these have been removed and put in a separate um, commercial development, uh, but this is the area that's a subject of the variance. Morgan Lane um, goes here and um, when this portion of uh, this um, preliminary development plan was approved in 2016, it was approved subject to the condition that Morgan Lane would be connected to Comet Lane when this phase of the development was uh, constructed. And when we look at variance requests, as you know, we look at the review criteria in Section 20-813J of the subdivision regulations. And the first thing we look at is, would the strict application of the regulations create an unnecessary hardship on the applicant? And in the waiver request that was included with your packet, the applicant noted that uh, the proposed single dwelling development would have fewer vehicles and fewer, fewer vehicle trips per day than the previously approved multi-dwelling development that the connection of the two streets might increase traffic on Morgan Lane, which is a private street, which could increase accessibility and costs for the adjacent property owners, and that the connection would require a reconstruction of a portion of Morgan Lane, uh, primarily because of the grade change, and possibly the relocation of utilities, and the applicant provided a summary of the estimated cost. So while there may be additional engineering or maintenance for the road, these changes would not necessarily constitute an unnecessary hardship. The definition of unnecessary hardship notes that mere financial loss or the loss of a potential financial advantage does not constitute a necessary hardship. 
the city engineer does not support the variance and his comment was included in the staff memo. Uh, he noted that the existing dead end is a temporary condition and the permanent condition needs to be constructed with this phase of the development. He also noted that if the street is not connected, eastbound traffic uh, could cut to the private driveway on the property um, north of Morgan Lane to connect to Comet Lane north. Um, so the finding is that the impacts of this requirement would not meet the definition of an unnecessary hardship as a property could be used for a conforming use and the owner would not be deprived of their property. The second criteria we look at is whether the variance is in harmony with the intended purpose of the subdivision regulations. In section 20-801 of the subregs notes, since the allocation and arrangement of parcels of land for both private uses and public uses helps to influence the health, safety, economy, livability, and amenities of an area, these regulations are intended to I provide for the harmonious and orderly development of land within the city and the unincorporated area of Douglas County by making provisions for adequate open space, continuity of the transportation network, recreation areas, drainage, utilities, and related easements, light and air, and other public needs. The proposed variance would not provide the street connection that is required by the subdivision regulations to provide for the continuity of the transportation network. And finally, we look at whether or not the public health, safety, and welfare would be protected with the granting of the variance. And the Fire Prevention Division indicated the fire code would not require the extension of the street. So the variance would not impact the public health, safety, or welfare. And so staff is recommending denial of the requested variance from Section 20-8012 connections, which is requesting that Morgan Lane not be required to connect to Comet Lane. And as this uh, was before you in December and action was deferred, we have the full recommendation. Um, and uh, like I said, we'd be happy to answer questions or discuss a preliminary development plan again, if you'd like. Uh, but the recommendation was to forward the preliminary development plan to the city commission with a recommendation for approval subject to the conditions noted in the staff report. Uh, to forward the modification requested from the parking requirements. Uh, the applicant is requesting additional parking to ensure that parking doesn't have to occur on Morgan Lane. And staff is recommending forwarding that to the City Commission with a recommendation for approval. And staff is recommending denial of the variance that's being requested tonight. <laughs> And to the conditions, uh, there were four conditions. Two of these have been met. The applicant has provided a revised plan that uh, address conditions A and B. Uh, condition C is the next step in the process before the final development plan can be recorded. A final plat will need to be recorded. And um, condition D is a technical condition. Um, municipal services and operation engineer had provided data for the downstream sanitary sewer analysis, and they just asked that the applicant acknowledge it or provide their own data so they have the correct information. And that concludes my application or my presentation. I know the uh, applicant, I believe, is present as well. Thank you, Mary. The applicant for this, uh, Alan Balot, um, if you'd like 10 minutes to. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. Um, we go to page 33 of your re report on the variance, Mary. Whoever's running that. Is there a graphic there that you want to see or? It's, it's the city commission meeting, meeting minutes from um, uh, February 8th of 2000. Almost at the end. Ooh. Well, if, 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 if we can't get the graphic up, if you'll trust what me repeating what the uh, minutes from the city commission were in the um, uh, February of uh, 2000 regarding the benefit district around that area. And it was moved by Hodges and seconded by Henry, who were the commissioners at that time, to delete the Morgan property from the Comet Lane Benefit District and the motion carried unanimously. The city commission concurred to direct staff to not plan any access to the Morgan property from Comet Lane. That's the city commission speaking, not planning staff. If you could bring up the graphic that I submitted today called access easements. This is a copy of the plat that was filed in 
February of 96 for this area. And I've highlighted in two different colors the, the traffic pattern for this area as it was to develop. And the green are platted access easements. They're the, basically the same as, as streets as far as your right to use them for public vehicles. Morgan Lane is an access easement. There's an access ease, two access easements and their utility easements. So they're wider than a street would be, but to allow traffic to go through the Jacksonville apartments and connect with West 7th Street. So there's adequate, more than adequate <clears throat> circulation among this property or through this property. The city commission directed staff in 2000 not to connect Comet Lane with Morgan Lane, although Morgan Lane wasn't that name by, at that time because it wasn't named. <clears throat> we're, we're trying to, to build lowercase a affordable housing. <clears throat> it's a waste of resources and a waste of money, and it increases the cost of the land if we have to connect Comet Lane and defeats part of the purpose of what we're trying to achieve. And this is what I call some of the hidden costs of development that people don't see. These conditions are put on plans that really not supposed to be there. Um, <clears throat> from what I read from the city commission meeting minutes, but it's an excessive cost to connect a, um, a public street with a access easement that already provides the connectivity and the neighborhood uh, circulation that the st staff has already mentioned in their report. And it's an unnecessary requir requirement for this development. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm sure we'll have some questions for you. If you, you are you sit down. actually, yes. So, so we can make room for public comment if there is any. So just needed to hear that. So is there anybody who in the chamber who would like to speak to item number two for public comment? Is there anybody online that would like to speak to item number two for public comment? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission for discussion. Okay, I have a question. Um, do we have anybody from engineering um, available to uh, answer a question? What, what, let me, I'll, I'll show you what I'm trying to get at here while we decide who needs to answer that. Um, aside from the commitment from some time ago to connect Morgan with um, the other street, I've lost, lost that already. Um, Aside from that commitment, that sounds like it might have been waived at some point. Is there anything pressing from engineering that's asking us to make this connection? Is anyone in engineering saying, yep, I've looked at this and all of those access points that exist today are in fact insufficient? Um, Commissioner, we don't have any of the engineering uh, personnel here. They provided the comment that's included in your memo. Um, the city engineer did indicate that he felt that the connection was important. And so um, we're just relying on that statement. All right, Mary, thank you for that. So let me just click into that for just just a, a second. When the engineer takes a look at that, does the engineer consider only city streets or would the engineer give equal weight to these rights of access that are being used in this particular development? He looked at everything. The Morgan Lane is a private street, which is intended to provide general public transportation. Those access easements through the parking lot, those are access easements next to apartment buildings, and they aren't intended to carry the same traffic a private street is, but it is intended to allow the public to travel into the um, area and then on to the north. So he looked at all those items when he made his recommendation. Thanks, Mary. Just while well, I've got you, just one last question for you. When you think about um, the condition that this that those roads would be connected, done at some point in time, and the comment that Mr. Blot had made about the city commission removing that condition, do you do you agree that the city commission did remove that condition? They didn't. Well, 
I don't think he mentioned that they removed it. They placed, they were forming a benefit district for the construction of Comet Lane. And the meeting was to see who was going to participate in the benefit district. And the Morgans did not want to participate. So they were excluded from the benefit district. And, and their comment was because they don't want to use Comet Lane. So they were excluded from the benefit district with the condition that they could not connect to it since they weren't paying in the benefit district. However, in 2016, when this property began developing, we took it back to the city commission and we told them that we thought the connectivity would be important. And so they removed that and they said, yes, it should connect, even though they did not participate in the benefit district for Comet Lane, they should connect and use that for their access. And that was 2016, 16 years after the the comment that were, was referenced tonight. All right. Thank you, Mary. Other comments from commissioners? I want to say just a quick comment. I would be reluctant to have that um, easement through the development be a major way people getting in and out of that area, especially with people backing up from driveways on their apartments, um, having that be some kind of act as a street, uh, act as a public street um, through the complex. Basically a parking lot. Yeah. So. I have a question for Randy, if you could come on. Welcome. Hello. Um, <laughs> I've heard you say many, many, many times that the acts of one city commission are not binding on future city commissions. Uh, could you walk through that with what we're looking at here from a city commission in 2000, a city commission in 2016, and what we have today? Yeah, you know, there are, there are some things that are binding. I mean, you know, you pass a law, but of course, laws can always be amended. So none of that's binding. But you can't like bind them on promissory things into the future. So, you know, anything that a commission does at one particular time, other than perhaps maybe some contractual issues where there's no way of, of, of getting out of it, will be binding on a future commission. So, for example, if you pass an ordinance, future commission can pass an ordinance changing it. So, to that extent, that's that's the. What, what we're talking about when we say the actions of one commission cannot bind the actions of another. And you've been able to look at this item, I would guess. You're familiar with it. <laughs> to be honest with you, I have only seen it cursorily. I haven't seen it in depth. I have, wasn't asked about it. I was able to look at this a little bit today. Um, and so, but I can't answer questions if you have it regarding this. Well, the question is, you know, Mary was making the comment that the city commission meeting in 2000 was only to remove a certain property from the benefit district. And it appeared the agreement was you would not be able to connect to this road you're not um, participating in payment for. Is that your that understanding of what happened? That was what happened in 2000, and that's not atypical. Typically, when you have a benefit district or an, an improvement district, what you do is you create the district, and everybody who's benefited by the improvement pays money. Now, that typically involves properties that have ac direct access to it or use that access to move around throughout the city, so other streets like that. If there was no access for the Morgans to get to that property, then they would not have necessarily been benefited and the city may have excluded them from the benefit district. Now that does not preclude a future development or a future extension of that road. But at that time it was decided the Morgans, because they were not gonna take access onto that road would not be benefited by it. So they did not have to participate in the improvement district. I'm not familiar with what exactly was decided in 2016. Can you fill us in on that? That I am not. Yeah, I don't. I would have to look at that a little bit more. I know a little bit more about what happened in 2000 than I do in 2016. Okay, thanks. Maybe Mary, can you fill us in a little bit about 2016? 
Yes, we were reviewing the preliminary development plan for the eastern portion of this um, the property that you're looking at now, there's a property just to the east that had a residence. And so they were revising the preliminary development plan for this parcel and for that parcel to the east. But at the time, they were only planning on developing the parcel to the east. And basically, they were going to keep the residence and add a contractor shop. So uh, the preliminary development plan went through. And we looked at the connection of Morgan Lane at that time, just like we are now. And um, it was staff and the Municipal Services and Operation, which was our Public Works Department at the time, our stance that it should be connected, but we thought we should uh, take it to the City Commission and have them make that decision because they had previously said it should not be. And so there was a memo to the City Commission that we provided um, stating that we wanted that to be a requirement. Rather than a variance of the Planning Commission like you see now, we took a memo to the City Commission just to get their information whether or not we should uh, be able to require the connection, and they voted that we should, and so that was made a condition. However, it was delayed until this phase was constructed because it would be more additional traffic. What they were doing previously really wasn't going to add any traffic. So thank you, both of you, for the history. So that brings us to the point of how this is coming to us as a request for a variance because of the 2016 decision that they should be connected. Is that fair to say? I believe we may need a variance anyway. I mean, it's a code requirement. And I don't know if, if we were gonna have it not be connected, I would have to ask Randy if we could rely on the city commission's 2002 decision or if we would have to get a variance to allow that to continue, and I don't know. Theoretically, the city commission could say that and would need a variance, but typically when a development like this comes through, we would make them follow the city code. And so at that point in time, there is a very good chance that they would have to get a variance if the city code required it. Now, if there was some type of written agreement or something that was uh, that ran with the property, it was recorded, something of that nature, that might be something different. Mm -hmm. Is there any known written agreement like that? I am not aware of any. Okay. Does the commission have a comment or a question for the applicant? Well, it seemed in the short time, I was going to say in the short time I have been here, I do not know that I've seen a developer more accommodating than you have been at the last meeting, that you were, the reasonableness that you um, showed, I, I thought was laudable to say the least. So it looks to me like when the fire department is coming in and saying, we don't need a connection to be safe, that to me that is an important consideration. Um, we have touted safety on many other things, and it doesn't seem that safety is the issue on this or not being safe for what you would develop. So then it comes down to code. Code says in 2000 that they didn't have to connect and in 16 it was changed. The safety is a factor that I certainly am considering. So question for you, Mr. Balot. Um, yes. Can you expand a little bit on the costs associated with doing this if the decision to uh, not grant the waiver was made? Well, there's been a lot of things said since I've sat down. Can I respond to those as well as your question, Mr. Rexford? Madam Chairman? Yes, you can take a few minutes. To okay. Um, Mary is not correct in her recollection of how this was brought to the City Commission. Preliminary development plan is approved by the Planning Commission, and it's taken to the City Commission for the zoning ordinance to be heard. It's on the consent agenda. They don't look at anything on it. If the staff makes an approval or recommends approval, 
when planning commission recs and rents approval, it's approved, it's approved in the consent agenda. There was nothing brought out about this connection. This connection was a result of a staff request, not an ordinance, a staff request. Okay. At that time, it wasn't that big a deal because we were proposing 30 apartment units. Now, seven years later, we're proposing 16 single family houses. It's a lot easier to amortize the cost of an extension over 30 apartment units than it is 16 houses. The economy has changed. <clears throat> the real estate environment has changed. I just came from a meeting with the city manager where he said that we need city affordable housing and we also need private development affordable housing. <clears throat> if we have to make a 50 foot connection to a street that already has two other connections within uh, 75 feet, the, the connectivity reason goes away. You don't need common lane. You've got an access easement. This was all planned out in 96, way before Mary, way before I was here or was aware of this development. I'd also like to point out that there were two comments by the city commission. One was directing them not to connect to common lane, make no plan to connect to common lane. The other one was another motion that said to direct staff to prepare necessary resolutions for the formation of a benefit district of Comet Lane, south of West 6th Street, presented to staff an exclusion of the Morgan property. Those are two different discussions that are going on. Two different votes were taken. One was do not connect Morgan Lane to Comet Lane, and the other was don't include Morgan Lane in the benefit district. I don't know what the discussion was at that time, and the minutes are kind of cryptic, but they may have taken into consideration the access easements that were platted on the, on the property as it was platted, as being sufficient to get through to 7th Street, which was a right-of-way. I don't know that, but it meets the desire of the code for connectivity. And the fire department does not, re does not need that connection to maintain public health, safety, and welfare. So get back to the lowercase affordable A, you're just adding $3,000 to the cost of a lot for this 50 foot connection that doesn't need to be there. And if we're struggling to find <clears throat> affordable housing and affordable lots in this community, we don't need to spend that money. Let me just ask one more. Well, let me ask. Didn't quite get that specific. That's that's. I think I got oh. most of it though. But oh. one more, one more, one more question. Kind of a hard question. Outside of the cost associated with making this connection, is there a reason to not have that connection there? Is there something about the environment that, that having that connection would be problematic? No, there's nothing the matter with having the connection being problematic. It's just a waste of resources. The cost of doing it. Yeah. It's a cost of doing it in an environment that that is, try, is struggling to save costs and provide housing for people. Yeah, that's sure. Which seems to be a prime goal of this community and an urgent need. Um, and it's just, I think it's just an unnecessary uh, expense. And the connectivity of the neighborhoods and subdivisions has already been taken care of through the platted access easements. Okay. It's not a parking lot. It's an access easement. There may be cars parked on it, but there's cars parked on Morgan Lane. Okay? But it's an access easement. You can't deny people access through that property. Same as a street. Can't be taken away. Can't be blocked. Did I answer your question? Susan? Thank you. Thank you. Other questions and comments? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Between 2000 and now, we had a land development code come in to effect in 2006. And this um, application is being reviewed under that code. And the request is for a variance. So, <clears throat> and the argument is it's an unnecessary cost. And that is not a reason for a variance, unfortunately. I can agree with everything Mr. Blot's saying about this may not be... <laughs> cost effective it may get in the way of other things but that's a policy decision and um 
we need to apply the rules of a variance with the current code. And unfortunately, I don't think it meets the criteria for a variance, but it is one of those cases that if it's appealed, if we don't approve the variance and if it's appealed to the city commission, they can certainly make a policy decision about the affordability and the, and the money part. But our, our duty is to apply the code to what's before us. And with that, I'm a, in my opinion, we don't meet the requirements for a variance, even though I highly... It's highly likely the city commission will grant that on an appeal, but I don't think we have the ability to make a decision based on the cost. We have been here before with a variance. Here many times. Yes, um, that doesn't meet the criteria of a variance. That is true, um, but um, both those have gone either way on these sorts of situations. Um, so, other comments from other commissioners, what they're feeling, questions they have about the, what um, Commissioner Carpenter may have said, what Mr. Ballot has said, what Mary. So is, 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 I know, I know. It's, it's, it's Yeah, I, I have a, just yeah. a process question. Yeah. Um, if we were to recommend approval of the, of the development plan and, um, but, recommend denial of the variance, what would be the next step for the applicant? So the, you would recommend the PDP, but then deny the variance? Is that If that were the outcome of the commission's actions. So the preliminary development plan would continue up for going through the review process, and then the variance could be appealed to the city commission for their review and consideration under the code. It would, it would take a, an active appeal by the applicant. Correct. A separate action. Yes. Okay. Okay. Does that help? I, I would, I come yes. back to this. If, if it is just rules that we are, that we have, this is the rule. Why, why even come to us? Exactly. Why, why come to this group? If the rules say X, Y, Z, well, they don't need Charlie Thomas. Boom. It's done. We need you, Charlie. But, <laughs> but when at this point i i think there the the rule of reason and logic in for me might dictate does dictate probably that i would vote to approve the variance or or you don't need a charlie thomas and a 10 other people on this committee, if all we're supposed to do is follow the rules, oh, that's the rule. We don't need to hear from you. Bye. I I would hope that we are more than that. That we that we are here to listen to the people, that we are here to um, humanely consider what people are saying, and we are not just rubber stamps. So I I guess I get to vote last, and I'll, <laughs> That's right. yes. I, I do will know to... by, the, by the last how I'm going to vote. Yeah. But I, I, I do appreciate what you have said and the manner in which you have approached us, not just this time, but the last time. And I, I, will, I will probably, yeah. I will vote for the variance. Well, I, 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 I dearly appreciate. Uh, I will vote for it. Commissioner Thomas's uh, viewpoint. I will make a, a plug a little bit for consistency um, in applying um, said rules that we have um, and not have it be dependent on which applicant is before us at what time um, in applying the rules for variances. Can I make a closing yes. comment? Yeah. So, or oh, no, actually, Commissioner Devore has oh, a comment. So, yeah, yeah. Just, I, I just wanted to give Mary an opportunity to respond to that. Is it, is it just that we're wanting to follow the rule, Mary, or is there, uh, what is the public benefit to uh, having this uh, variance denied? In a way, it's to allow the continuity, you know, and um, as Commissioner Ashworth said, uh, some consistency, we have to draw the line, when do we require streets to be connected? You know, and I guess you can make the point, you see in this point, we don't need to connect streets, and then perhaps with another subdivision, if they want to save money, 
um, you might see that those streets don't need to be connected. And um, Jeff may be able to answer the question better than I can, but I think it's um, just trying to maintain some of the good planning principles of connectivity and giving people more options in which directions they can drive. When we should there was a Jeff, no? okay Jeff Jeff will say whether I'm right or wrong, but always I hope. Um, but this it, when we consider a variance, we are in a quasi judicial role, so we have to be very careful and we have to apply the law evenly and impartially, and that means that's why the big reason of just financial reasons is not a justification. That's state law. That state case law, that is that is the law. And the only reason we have here stated as a justification is it's going to cost more. We do have an avenue and we do have a voice. That's why we're here to say we think we're going to apply the law, but the result. Excuse not, me. Yeah. Excuse yeah. me, sir. Oh, he's executive. Oh.